am recording now. And let me get my, oh, here. Yeah. And hey, there it is. Any minute now, there we go. All right. Hi, this, I'm Andrea Miller. I'm the founding board member for Center for Common Ground. And welcome to tonight where I'm going to be talking about the road to the midterms through the uh, rural South. And we're going to give Arizona temporary rural South status. So we are a Virginia-based 501c3 that makes us nonpartisan in all the work that we do. We run three main campaigns, Reclaim Our Vote, which most of you are familiar with, um, our new campaign is the Democracy Centers. Those are just getting started in Georgia, South Carolina. And uh, we are talking to Mississippi and several other Southern states that Southern Echo represents, and then also North Carolina, and then the Vote Equality Campaign. We are also a tech program. People who have used our texting program, Tax Percent, um, Tax Percent uses some of the technology that we developed to find polling locations for early voting. And we also build chatbots, things that allow voters who are totally on the wrong side of the digital divide to just use their home phones to call a number and get the information that they need about the vote. The new piece that we are adding for 2021, um, I call it civics or civic engagement. And unlike a lot of organizations that are only working at the federal level, we will be doing some support work at the federal level, and we will be doing a lot of work at the state level. So on Monday and next Friday, I will be talking to several groups of large national groups where I sit with them at a DC table about the importance of walking and chewing gum at the same time. Yes, we are going to need to push very, very hard on federal legislation. However, the states are under assault and we are really going to need to help the states push back. The states are going to have to know that somebody cared about them when there wasn't a federal election. Otherwise, come 2022, they are going to just stay home because there is no way we can pretend we did not know about the assault on voting that is going on in our Southern states. Now, tonight we're going to be talking about the war on the states. We're going to be looking at what their strategy is and the challenges going forward. And then we'll be talking about how we win. Now, their strategy is to change the way election or voting works. And they're going after three critical things. They're going after some people call it absentee voting. We know it more as vote by mail. They're going after vote by mail. They're going after early voting in some states. And they are aggressively going back to list maintenance. So Chris Kobach, interstate cross check, has been totally identified as just a junk system designed to discredit voters. They are already talking about either reinvigorating, raising up interstate cross-check from the dead or coming up with something equally bad on their own. 
what we're going to be looking at in some level of detail is a report from the GOP election confidence task force. When you want to talk about masters of marketing and double speak, we are looking at it right here. The election confidence task force sounds a lot better than the voter suppression or we don't want black and brown people to vote task force. And this is basically what they are seeking to do. They want to make major, major changes to vote by mail so that it becomes incredibly difficult to vote by mail. We already talked about Georgia has had no excuse absentee voting or vote by mail since 2005. They are now trying to introduce, you must have an excuse in order to vote by mail. And right now, one of the bills in their Senate sets the age limit at 75. The age limit for vote by mail in Mississippi is 65. So these people are playing for keeps. They want to end automatic voter registration at the DMV. So when you go to the DMV and you sign up to get your driver's license or you are changing your driver's license, they want to require voters to opt in and say, yes, make these changes as opposed to the way it is now, which says you opt out and say, please don't change my voting record. They are floating the, not, the notion of doing voter purges 60 days before an election. That means people who have been removed from the rolls will potentially have no idea that they've been removed from the rolls, nor will anyone else find out in time to do anything about it. They want to create a handwriting analysis department so that they can do signature verification and signature matches. And they are giving the counties control of the voter purge list. They want every registered voter to be compared to a felon list. Felons in Georgia can, under certain circumstances, vote. And again, when we look at the mess they made with interstate cross-check, they are potentially only going to be looking at names and not much else. And when they come up with two people with the same name and one of them is a felon, they're going to strike the other one from the rolls also. They are requiring a witness signature on every absentee ballot envelope. When you make your application, you need to provide your driver's license or photo ID. They are going to completely eliminate drop boxes. Or if they keep a drop box, drop boxes can only be at early voting sites and they can only be available during the time when the early voting location is open and they must have the ability to scan a photo ID and print a receipt. Well, if they're going to do all that, why bother to have the darn thing? You might as well go in and early vote. They are going to eliminate third parties sending absentee ballot applications, and there is a $10,000 fine if you are found guilty of doing such. They want to eliminate third party absentee ballot curing. You cannot provide food or beverages or, quote, anything of value to voters that are waiting in line. The Secretary of State will compare Georgia's voter list to other states. Again, that is exactly what interstate cross-check was all about. And we ended up losing 7 million voters due to interstate cross-check because they were only looking at first name and last name. They were not looking at dates of birth. So when you had a father and son who happened to have the same name and they just happened to live in different states, 
they were not looking at suffixes. They were only looking at first name and last name. And they said, oh, gee, got golly, we have a Jonathan Washington living in Georgia, and we have a Jonathan Washington living in Kansas. They must be the same person voting in two states. So they would remove them both. And only political parties may have credentialed observers in any circumstances in conducting elections in Georgia. Now, here's why this is so problematic. This was put together by the GOP and it has all the looks of coming through a bill mill where basically they were supposed to substitute whatever state is on here with the name of your state. Well, there was a place where they forgot to remove Iowa. So it is obvious this is being circulated and shopped to all of the Republican leadership in all of the various states. We even saw some of these bills introduced in Virginia. They were rapidly killed in subcommittee, but they were still introduced nonetheless. Now, strangely enough, there are some very good voter improvements in this election confidence plan. Number one, and we lived this in Georgia, counties must post early voting and election day locations 60 days before the election. Uh, we knew some counties that posted the Friday before the election that was on Tuesday. Also, polling locations cannot change unless there is physical damage to the building or there is a state of emergency, i.e. hurricane, um, locust, whatever. And their concept is no voter should have to drive more than 30 minutes to early vote or vote on election day. All counties must provide one Saturday for early voting. Um, and we saw in 2020, many of the smaller counties did not. And this is a huge one. They must establish uniform hours and days across all counties for early voting. Frankly, we would have been happy if they established uniform hours and days within a county, because in most states with early voting, you have multiple days when early voting locations come online and they are open multiple times. So in HR1, they call for all early voting locations to be open 10 hours a day. This does not specify the number of hours they must be open, but it says it needs to be uniform. One of the other improvements is, while it doesn't mandate paper ballots, it says paper ballots must be an option at all polling places for both early voting and election day voting. This is a huge one. The state of Georgia will require open source election equipment. So no more proprietary election equipment. We have no idea how the heck this thing is counting votes. And um, I already had the provide once Saturday early voting. Um, oh, I, I was so much in love with that. I repeated it twice. I was like, this is really good. I was enjoying that one. So this is what it looks like. And then there's one other exceeding, well, okay, this is another huge improvement. Um, people who work in the Secretary of State's office cannot become part of a revolving door where they go from the Secretary of State's office to become a vendor or a consultant for at least 24 months because what they found was one of the people that was in charge of certifying the election equipment, actually his primary 
customer was the um, election vendor. So it's like, ooh, conflict of interest, you think. So they've managed to do some good things, but the good things do not offset all the bad things that they're doing. One other very, very, very concerning thing that we are seeing coming out of this is a new rule regarding presidential elections. Wow. And one of those rules is that if there are challenges to the election, it goes directly to the Supreme Court of the state. And then there are various versions of what happens next. In Georgia, the governor calls the state legislature in. And then the state legislature does theoretically have the power to overturn who the voters have voted for and select totally different electors. They don't specifically say that in this election confidence report, but the legislation that we are seeing in Georgia and in Arizona are actually allowing that. Now, what we are doing one of the big problems in the states is that there are a few groups that maybe look at what the legislature is doing, but those groups do not engage voters in any meaningful way so that voters are really aware of the good things and or the bad things that are being done in their name at the state house and the state senate. So what we are doing is we are going back and re-engaging the voters that we spoke with for the 2020 general and runoff election. And we are specifically targeting senators and house members that are in districts with large community of color populations. And we're calling voters who voted absentee. And we're letting them know that their elected representative is trying to drastically limit vote by mail. And then we give them a suggestion of what they could say to the legislator. And then we ask, would they like to be connected? So between our catch through calling efforts, which launched in earnest, probably on Tuesday, Monday night was training, Tuesday people were just starting to get their feet wet we are actually really connecting voters to their legislators. Because one of the things that we've been told over and over again is that voters need to be engaged. If we don't engage voters and we just leave them alone for 18 months and then come running back in there when it's time for another election, they are not going to engage again. How many times do we have to make the same mistake before we figure out it's a mistake? It happened to us in 2010 and it happened to us, um, you know, it just swings back and forth. We get citizens to vote. We don't engage them. We don't help them understand what's going on. And then we come running back in two years and want them to vote again. They look around, nothing has changed in their neighborhood or their community. And they say, you know what, voting doesn't work. And just like the person in Alabama, I voted for a Republican, there was sewage in my backyard. Voted for a Democrat, still sewage in my backyard. Whoever gets the sewage out of my backyard, that's who I'm voting for. So if people know who is causing them pain, causing things to be difficult for them to vote, this will encourage them. Don't just vote for president and US Senator and then stop 
we're going to need you to go all the way down that ticket, whatever that ticket is. And we want you to know what is being done to you in your name by the people that you pay to be in office. So we're asking them to call, email. Um, we aren't expecting a lot of people to be on Twitter, but hey, one never knows. And to tweet and or leave a message for their legislator. Now, on Monday, when I look at our Georgia voter engagement, there were about 67 people who had taken action with our Ignite Advocacy Tool. Right now, we're about 300 and 90 people who have either called, but we've had nine people tweet, so a couple of people have Twitter, and a lot of people send emails. Before I got on this call, I went and looked at the ACLU of Georgia site. I looked at their fight website. Nobody in Georgia is talking about what is going on in the Georgia legislatures and why people in Georgia should give a rat's bottom. They're just not. So fine, we will step in and tell the voters in Georgia what is going on. So as I said, I have meetings on Monday and Friday with other organizations. We sit together at a national table to sort of say, we're gonna to need to walk and chew gum at the same time. We will advocate at the federal level. You're in DC, I get it. All of you have people in all these other states on your mailing list. If we all work together, we will take care of tracking it and writing it and building it. All you've got to do is send it to your people, um, copy what we did in our messaging, and then get your folks to sign it so that we can turn up the pressure and let these legislators know people are watching what they're doing. And you will be judged and held accountable. Now, Right now, we are working in Georgia and Virginia. Virginia is going into special session because the activists, the citizens of Virginia in 2017 decided enough was enough. We're not waiting for the Democratic Party to save us or somebody else. We want to be saved. We're going to need to save ourselves. All the bad voting legislation that was introduced in Virginia died immediately. Virginia is about to become the first Southern state to abolish the death penalty, to say, we are going to restore voting rights upon release from prison. We also had another constitutional amendment passed that said, we will never take away voting rights because if you are a citizen of the Commonwealth of Virginia of voting age, you have fundamental right to vote in any public election held in the jurisdiction in which you reside. And that passed in the Virginia Senate. So when we go into our special session, uh, we're going to be looking at getting full passage and getting the differences in those bills ironed out. Virginia is also getting ready to pass the most comprehensive marijuana legislation law. If you are going to legalize marijuana and you are going to be equitable, fair, and just about it, you must do three things, not just legalize. Number one, you are going to make possession of marijuana even for recreational use by people 18 and older, no longer a crime. Number two, everybody that has been in prison for simple marijuana possession, you let them out. And number three, because it is no longer a crime, you immediately, for no charge, requiring nothing on their part, expunge their records. And Virginia went one step further. It said, because we will be taxing marijuana sales and we understand the tremendous hardship this has caused on some communities, 
they are going to take part of those proceeds and they will use it for reparations. And they are also requiring that when they sell or make these marijuana licenses available, that we make them available to communities that were harmed the most by the policy. So again, this is Virginia, y'all, Virginia. So we know what can happen. So our next state will be Arizona. These states are in the order in which their legislatures lead. So Virginia basically is done right around the middle of March. Georgia will be done around the middle of April. And then we will immediately begin work in Arizona, probably next week. I've been placed in contact with a legislator and progressive groups on the ground. And we're going to go after some of those really bad bills that are in Arizona. Again, letting people know, is this really what you want your representatives to be doing? Because in Arizona, they're going after the permanent early voting list. They want to get rid of that. Arizona is where people go to retire. You sign up for the permanent early voting list, and then you are permanently on the vote by mail list. They want to get rid of Pebble. So we want to make sure that there can be some major fightbacks by the citizens from Arizona. Florida basically has a number of similar voting laws to Georgia. Remember this paper, the GOP election confidence report has been circulated to all the states, South Carolina and then Texas. Because Mississippi um, basically brought up all the good bills early, democracy died in Mississippi on February 2nd. So all the good bills, Mississippi was trying to get early voting. They were trying to get no excuse absentee voting. They were trying to get online voter registration. All of those bills were killed on February 2nd. So this is where we're going to be working. This is why the states are going to be coming up in the order that they come up. It's based on when their legislatures go out. Um, Pennsylvania, where we're going to do some work, they basically go uh, the entire year. So Pennsylvania will be coming up after Texas. Pennsylvania had some very bad voter suppression bills as well. Um, a quick plug for the phone bank. We've got a lot of guided phone banks that are coming up. And if you go to either the center for commonground.org and click on Georgia, it will bring you to a page where there's just all the information you could ever want about phone banks. You can sign up for them. Um, and I'm sure people are dropping those links in the chat. Now, we do have some upcoming elections in 2021. The 11th district in Ohio will be having a congressional election uh, because Marsha Fudge will be moving over to um, be the cabinet member in charge of um, housing. So that election will probably be in May. She has not officially been appointed yet, but once that appointment becomes official, then they will announce there will be a special election to fill her seat. Uh, two days ago, the congressman from the Texas 6th District died of COVID. So we do not currently know when that, that congressional race will be held because it literally would be 
for the entire term. The governor cannot appoint someone to fill that seat. They are going to have to hold a new election. Um, in Virginia, we have our statewide offices this year, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Attorney General, and the entire 100 seat Virginia House is up. In Charlotte, the mayor of Charlotte and 12 city council seats, and in Atlanta, the mayor of Atlanta and 16 city council seats. We are also looking at a number of significantly smaller elections in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and a number of other places. And finally, we have two new series that are going to be beginning this month. The Accelerating Justice series will be starting next Thursday at 8. Accelerating Justice when Justice is Not Equal. We will be joined by Senator Mujtaba Mohammed from North Carolina, who is responsible for implementing the legislative requirements for achieving racial equity in the criminal justice system. In future weeks, we will have people who are responsible for doing the work at the judicial level, at the law enforcement level, and at the community level, where we believe it will give groups or people who have an idea about what do we need to look at for racial equity in criminal justice reform? This will basically give you the playbook of who the stakeholders are you're going to want to engage, how you're going to want to engage. This was Governor Roy Cooper's task force in North Carolina that put this together. So it'll be Senator Mohammed, Reverend Rodney Sadler, and Gabby Lemus, our two board co-chairs, and Vanessa Gonzalez from the Leadership Committee on Human and Civil Rights. So that will be next Thursday at 8 p.m. The following Thursday, we have a brand new series, and that series is called Southern Voices. The Southern Voices series is going to take on what is going on in the South because it is a very unique place in the United States. So there is a Southern Green New Deal. What's in it? How does it work? There are rural electric cooperatives. You will be learning a lot more about them because anyone who cares about climate has to care about rural electric cooperatives. The fastest growing electricity selling entities in the country and more curious, wherever we are looking at major poverty, rural electric cooperatives are always there providing ultra high priced electricity. And then finally, broadband access. How is that preventing healthcare equity in the South when so many communities don't have broadband and the only way to sign up for your vaccination is on the internet? What do you do when there is no internet? So Reverend Leo Woodbury from Florence, South Carolina will be joining us and Chandra Farley from the Partnership for Southern Echo. So that is my presentation for tonight. So I'm gonna stop the share and I am going to allow you to unmute yourselves we got a good recording of the presentation and I will entertain questions. Yes, hi, this is uh, Thierry Doyen. I'm in, um, in Livermore, California. Yes, we and have, I know where that have, is. 
where we have beautiful sunsets. <laughs> this was yesterday. And um, I wanted to throw an idea that instead of trying to be defensive against their attacks, why don't we go big and bold and uh, look at what the little country of Estonia, right at the border of Russia, has been doing for I don't know how many years. And my boss used to be from Estonia, and that was a few years ago. And um, they are a complete digital citizenry. And they have been voting online for years and years and years with a complete secure system. So instead of trying to defend vote by mail with a bold um, Biden-Harris administration, why don't we look at where and how possible to also offer a vote by bit or a vote online option with all the security that we need to be able to verify the voting. And I mean, there's a number of issues to look into, but my proposal would be to have a group, a study group, look at what it would take to have a safe vote online option in as many of our states as possible and push for that. Not exclusively because some people don't have online access, but as a good option for anybody. Uh, thank you. Um, being a part of the election integrity group, uh, we are adamantly against vote by mail, um, against online voting in the United States. And most of us would rather die than see that, especially the way everything is working. We have proprietary equipment. Most companies that sell voting equipment are owned by Republican operatives. That is not anything that could be even entertained in the US in its current state of the way we run elections. So we have pretty much said, you need to vote on paper. Everybody knows how that works. And again, we have such huge areas of the country where there is no internet. So now we are further exacerbating what people don't have and pushing our rural, lower income community of color folks further back and out of democracy. So I'd be willing to look at it in another 10 years if we solve the broadband issue and or the next generation is now the generation that is in control. But where we are right now, this is not something I could see us successfully doing with any type of integrity in the next decade at the very least. Um, all of our voting equipment where people are voting on touch screens, it's not one person is one vote, it's one person is one is 100 one hundredths of a vote. Our equipment is very, very badly designed. It's designed to steal votes. So there is a reason for the lack of confidence in our election technology. And we're so not ready to go for that. But Thank you. So it's always good to have people thinking, going, couldn't we do something and really utilize computers? We're not there yet. As a people, as a country, I mean, we're still fighting over the results of the presidential election. I think we need another decade before I'm willing to allow us to do anything with computers. But thank you. Well, I, I hear you. And, <laughs> uh, and I think that, you know, we need we need bold, bold, big steps, not little tiptoes. Well, and, uh, I agree. We should we shouldn't we shouldn't say we're going to do it. But I think we should put some very mighty people who are experts uh, to uh, all the experts See if there's a, say a plan, all, a plan a plan that can be proposed. Right. All the experts now say don't do it. Don't go there. Okay. All right. All right. Other questions. Thank you. Thank you.
we're good? Is, is it possible we're going to get done early? Well, if anybody would like to join in the texting, uh, tell them, give me a call. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Goodbye. We are also texting Georgia voters, letting them know that um, there is that option to take action. What's really cool if they do the action on their cell phone is if they, when they click on the call tab and the phone number shows up, when they click the phone number, all they've got to do is push dial and their phone will automatically call. They don't even need to manually tap in the numbers. Andrew. Or texting. Oh, Catherine, go ahead and. Um, there we go. Yeah. What's your name in there? There's no, no it, we are um, allowing extra people to text um, now because we have 500,000 people to text. I didn't think we were going to have that many. I originally thought we were only going to have um, 100,000 or less. We have 500,000. Andrew, does that mean that people could text separate from phone banking? I, I could um, sign people, I could. Yes. Okay, how do I, um, how do I get that, you know, link and the instructions and everything to get people on that? Because we're, we're doing phone banking, but I think some people would be up for texting and not phone banking. Catherine, are we you doing six percent in Georgia right now, Catherine? Yes, yes, we are. Yeah. So, so yeah, just how? I put my name in. Um, just contact me, rov.newjersey at gmail.com or give me a call, 205 821 1209. I have it on the chat. You just write up there in the chat. Oh, okay. Oh, great. The other the other quick question is um, will we be doing it? People were ready for the um, the postcards to Virginia. So now we're going to be doing them to Arizona. When will we be starting? No, no, no. Uh, you're, you're going to be doing so postcards to Virginia, and it will be later this month. Virginia has purged its voters. So we have some things we need to do to get ready to postcard Virginia. We've got to write the scripts and do some other administrative work. Oh, okay. So it, it's still on, and, and the end of this, the end of this month. Well, the, we first are prioritizing Virginia postcarding groups, and we might actually already have enough postcarders within Virginia. This group called Postcards for VA um, wants to help out, but so at the moment, there's no active postcarding campaigns. But we will keep you all in the loop about that. All right, and then Ohio eleven. Um, I gave you the upcoming races because all those races will be utilizing postcards, probably definitely for GOTV. And just so people know, the postcarding will be very different from last year. Last year, we had a lot of addresses all year long. We probably did, we did 9 million postcards. This year, we might do a million postcards, it's gonna be spread out. Some will be just 15,000 to some rural county and those will go fast. So we won't have the same kind of robust postcarding this year. Right, we're going to have, and then we, we are going to do a number of small elections as well. So we're going to look at cooperative, rural electric, cooperative uh, races because the people who live in our target states are saying that is really what is a big problem and a concern for them. So again, really, really critical. Follow the lead of the people who are in the state where you are working. Help them uplift themselves. So our state partners are now stepping up and saying, this is really what we need. Now, I will tell you with the phone banking that we're doing, 
a lot of people um, are very, very interested in being patched through to their legislators. And then I'm going to be recruiting more people to do phone banking with us to, again, make sure voters know this is why we need you to vote. This is what is happening because voters don't know. No one seems to be bothering to tell them. Could I have a link please to the phone banking that patches through? It is right in the chat. I just put it in the chat again. So Thank it'll you. pop up. Thank you. And, and I, now I any of you who want to save the chat, I do allow you to save the chat because we've got a lot of links in there. And you would just go into the chat and at the bottom right, there's three dots to the right of the file. When you click on those three dots, it'll say more. And the first option will be save chat. If you save the chat, you will now have all the links that people have put in because I know when we say them a lot of time, it's very, very hard to get all that written down. Um, so save the I, chat. Can I just um, make an offer, please? Um, if there are postcards that are writ already written to Virginia by the end of this month, I can take them and mail them in state. Sometimes it's nice to have um, postcards that are mailed in state. Mm -hmm. It's just an offer. That's all. Okay. All right. I have a question on the phone. I, I, I have 4,000 postcards sitting in my, you know, my apartment right now. Uh, that's for, that's why you really want a postcard. We will yeah, help yeah, you yeah, get yeah. rid of those postcards, Arlene. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. I have a question about the phone banking I saw the uh, description somewhere. Is it a, an automatic dialer that automatically connects people or do you have no. to click to dial the next one? Uh, Gabe? Um, you have to click to dial the next one. It, it won't dial anyone without you clicking. Okay, good. That's what our people like. Right, exactly, exactly. Where you control when the next call gets made and it doesn't like run off and leave you hanging on for dear life. Yeah. Right. I, I would also add that this is one of the most user-friendly interfaces I've encountered. And, um, and I've used four other dialers. And we also have the advantage of um, when folks can't do it right uh, immediately and be patched through to their state senator, we can text them the phone number and what to say. So um, it's really, really cool. Yeah. And we have uh, three trainings a week now, Gabe, and local trainings all over the country. So we can text them directly from the system? Yes. yes. Oh my God, that's awesome. <laughs> really good. I have well, a question Joanne, about the dialer. Um, Joanne's had her hand up for a while. Oh, sorry. Can speak with Joanne. Can you unmute? Hi, hi, thanks. It's great to see everybody. So um, I don't think we're going to solve it tonight. I just want to put it out there and maybe folks can think about it. Andrea, um, it falls into the category of a nice problem to have. So I, um, I built up a really great group. We went from seven people to over 200 people. And we did, I don't know, between Georgia and um, in the presidential election, I think we did 30, 40,000 postcards, something like that. So, and I really tried, I really tried to get those people on the phone and try as I did, they hate the phone, they love their postcards. A few of them moved over to texting, but um, so now I've built this great group. You know, I had a lot of momentum and um, I don't wanna lose that. I really don't. And I hear that we're not going to do a lot of postcards. So, right. but at the same time, I know you were thinking about this six, nine months ago that there was so much enthusiasm right. to, to change our leadership and 
you had way more volunteers than you ever saw coming. You did way more postcards than you ever budgeted or thought that you would. And so again, under the category of a nice problem to have, we don't wanna lose all these people. We wanna keep them engaged and we need to give them something to do. And, and they can phone bank or text. When we look at postcarding, our postcarding was most effective in rural areas. Rural areas are very small. They are least effective in big cities. That's where the big numbers are. I think if you were able to give a video of people doing the phone banking to that postcarding set of groups. Yeah, we did that. We, we please, we, we did that. We, we did Zooms. We did one-on-one -on -one training. It, it, there, it's not happening. And I okay. hear about the postcards and I don't know what the solution is. Um, I'll definitely go out with the texting and I'll work with them. I, I don't, you know, I think, I, I don't know what the solution is. I'm looking for something else. And I, I don't know what that something else is. I'm gonna think about it too. Th these people absolutely wanna be engaged. I get, I get calls, I get emails. Right. They're chomping at the bit, right. you know, and they see this, they see this legislation and right. I'm in California. So, you know, our legislation, we, uh, we have democratic congressmen and you know, it's democratic everything. And so they really, they the really want to- The problem with legislation, an election has a fixed date when it's going to happen. Legislation does not have a fixed date. It doesn't lend itself to postcarding. Uh, there are some federal bills that are going to be project bills that maybe we could do something with that. But um, again, when we look at when the state houses are leaving, there's very little time for postcards. Okay, again, I didn't think we were gonna solve it here. I hear definitely postcards aren't the answer. I, and, and it's a strategic question, right? So it's right. not gonna be solved on this phone call. I just wanted to put it out there you know, maybe you go back, you think about it. If, if you want to go offline, we can talk about it. I'm a strategic thinker. It, I, I didn't expect to solve it. I just wanted to get people thinking about <laughs> it you, and put it out there. So thanks thank for hearing you. me. Joanne, Joanne right. one thing for your volunteers to know is that part of the reason that we're doing these great series is to educate our volunteers about what the issues are in the southern states. Because our volunteers tend not to live in the target state. So they all say, oh, I want a postcard. I want to do this. So I would encourage every volunteer to sign up for these. What is going on with the Southern New Deal and Southern climate justice, Southern economy, health care? What is going on with um, what the people in the South are trying to do about racial justice? And I think it'll help people really get engaged with the issues, not just the tactic of postcarding. And even if, if what they do is they want to get together in their group or their church or their synagogue and talk about racism and talk about systems and take action, that's just as important as postcarding. We're just trying to get everybody ready for the midterms. And that's part of how to get our volunteers ready for the midterms. Yeah. Also, uh, there are, um, Joanne, there are, there are campaigns going on right now um, with Flip the West. And, you know, that's a partisan group, but they're postcarding to the seditious seven um, in California. And, um, you know, so a couple people have mentioned it in the chat, but um, that if they're just, if they just have to postcard, <laughs> um, I personally, it's the, the message is more about voting them out in 2022. It's not about doing anything immediately. Um, but our I just want to plug the phone banking. This is really different than calling before an election when everyone's getting called and they all feel, you know, and people feel harassed. And um, it's really offering a service and, you know, telling people these legis this legislation is going to be passed if we don't do something or it's telling them that it's been introduced. And a lot of people know about it already and they're upset, but they haven't figured out what they can do. So we're offering to patch them through to their legislator's office 
and uh, the responses are are positive. And some people, you know, there's always some people who aren't interested or they'd rather take down the number and do it themselves. But it's an amazing tool to patch someone through and you get to listen to them leave a voicemail or listen to them speak to their um, legislator. And it's very powerful. I was deeply moved the first, I think the second call I made, I was lucky and I just hit the jackpot and this wonderful older man, you know, did it and he wrote the number down so he could tell his friends about it. And he, I heard him make the call and I almost cried. I was so moved. And this is really a whole different animal than calling, get out the vote or, you know, calling to tell people who to vote for or like other campaigns do. It's really, really different. Well, they, might wanna those, try. they might want to try it for, do yeah, five I'll, calls and see how they feel. I'll, I'll give those things a shot. And um, I've been really thinking about putting out the emails that you guys do to the bigger group. I've sent it out to my, I have seven team leaders. I've sent them out to my team leaders. Um, we're a temple, so we can't do anything that's partisan. Um, and, but we do have a racial justice group. And, and so I've been sharing some of what we've been talking about here with them. And so I'll, I'll keep on it. I'll keep pushing it. I really appreciate it. I've seen everybody's ideas coming up in the chat. I really appreciate that too. Oh, petitions, I see that. That's a great idea. Yeah, there's so, going to be a lot you. of petitions where people just sign and that way we get an idea as to how much support we have. And then when we hear it's going to a committee vote or a floor vote, then we turn and do letter campaigns. That's called clicktivism. And a lot of people do that. So right now, all the big national groups are focused on for the People's Act. When they get done with that, then they're doing the John Lewis Voter Rights and um, Advancement Act. And when they get done with that, then they're going to do DC statehood. In between, there are many other really good social justice issue bills that the big national partners don't really get behind as much. I mean, there'll be some great social security legislation and there'll be petitions coming out around that. Because remember in, in federal legislation, we need 218 people in the house and most of the time, 60 people in the Senate. So the Equal Rights Amendment removed the ratification deadline will be coming up and we think they may try for a vote this year instead of waiting until next year. And that will be a piece of legislation that we will work on. Um, I kind of resurrected that from the dead back in 2012. So I've got years on that. So we will be working on that. And then there's a lot of other little bills. We're going to be working on the constitutional right to vote. The big national partners aren't looking at that. They're looking at their piece of legislation that they've all put together. So um, Congress in the previous session introduced more than 9,000 bills in the 116th Congress. Even if we only got behind 200 bills, that's a lot of emails and a lot of petitions. Yeah. All right. I'd like to chime in and say that um, I think I think we should we should have an event that's specifically designed for uh, the people. Jo Joanne was talking about. Um, we had we had something like that last time called phone banking for introverts, um, and I think there there are certain things that we can em emphasize because it's really the interactivity that scares people with phone banking. It's uh, it's the fact that you will suddenly be in real time forced to talk to a, a human being, and I, there are a lot of aspects. 
of phone banking that are not interactive. And I think that's one of the things that you can emphasize is so many of these are just leaving voicemails. If, and in fact, if for a lot of these people who are terrified of phone banking, if, if they could know beforehand that, you know, out of 80 calls they're making, only a few of them are going to be talking to a real person and all of the ones where they're leaving voicemail, they're still doing the bulk of the good work. Um, I think it's just about framing it so that we're de-emphasizing no. the fact that you're being a salesperson and emphasizing the fact that you're sending texts and you're leaving voicemails. And so much of it is just those two things. Um, that's somewhere to start if you're just talking to people who are scared. Abe, can I just add one thing to add to oh, Carrie's uh, description? This campaign we're doing in Georgia right now, we are reaching only voters, marginalized voters over 50 years old. And I have found when I do uh, reach an actual person, they're savvy, they've been voters by mail, and it's inspiring to talk to them. So if any folks out there are wary about it, this is the place to start because you'll, especially older folks, you're calling your peers and it, it's so rewarding. And you can Agreed. do it uh, seven days a week, <laughs> nine to eight local time. <laughs> And then looking at, thanks Bart, and then looking at all the problems we had with voting, we're also going to be working on the postal service bill. So mm -hmm. I got a note from yeah. uh, Steve Mateo over at the postal service that they've got a bill that's really important. They A, are going to need to get more money and B, they need to not have to fund their pension 75 years in advance. Nobody else does that. So we need to stop making the Postal Service do that. And we also need to get rid of Louis DeJoy, fill out, well, we need to fill out the Board of Governors on the Postal Service, vote DeJoy out, and bring a career postal person back into that position. Mm -hmm. So again, there's a lot of things that aren't going to be all exciting and sexy that the big national organizations may go, yeah, we're going to pass on that. Where, you know, this is bread and butter folks and our folks are going to go, wait a minute, I want the post office to work. I'll, I'll sign that petition and share it with a couple of my neighbors. And that's really what we're going to need as well. Mm -hmm. And yes, I do love my postcarders, but I want your postcarding because you buy the supplies. I want it to be as meaningful as it can be. In 2019, the first time we ever sent out a postcard, we only postcarded rural counties where we either A, didn't have a phone number or B, the phone number was bad. And in Onslow County, we were able to go back and see that when we postcarded into that county, um, what was it? 25% of the voters we reached actually re-registered to vote. That is phenomenal for a postcard campaign to be 25% effective, unheard of. People were convinced that I had like moved a decimal. I'm like, the numbers are small enough that I could do that one. And I did it on my calculator because I didn't believe it at first either. So yeah, that's what we want. We want to be effective, fleet, agile, effective all right um a wonderful comment came up in chat what about um a group a, a fundraising group adopting one of the democracy centers and i think you know fundraising is a great opportunity if there are any postcarders out there who want something to do and are willing to fundraise right uh, yeah, as we get more and more and more of the democracy centers coming online, yes, we are going to need a 
very robust campaign for them because 99 and a half percent of our democracy centers are going to be going into low income areas. So that means that they really are going to struggle to like do their own postcards. So you'll maybe get to help them by postcard and or postcard with them. Everything that they're going to need, they are normally not going to have money for it because they're working with low income people where when they come and they work in the democracy center, they can't volunteer. If they don't work and get paid, they don't. Our group is excited to do this. We're already on board. We all just right, need all right. the name well, of us. Well, well, starting in March, I'm going to start bringing, well, you're going to meet Reverend Leo Woodbury in a couple of weeks. He is heading up the Democracy Center in, um, what is it, Florence, South Carolina. He is going to be talking about an amazing new project that we got into with him, never saw this one coming on the horizon. So I'm not gonna steal any of his thunder. I'm going to let him talk about what he is doing. Democracy centers are going to tell us, wow, our community needs X. We're not going to go in and tell them your community needs this because we don't know, we don't live there. I like that approach. And just remember, Andrea, Hemthrow's Poor People's Campaign in Coalition for GM Beach Coalition. We're here to help them. All this right. Station. All right. Yep. We're excited, though. Or we want to do the well. And, and again, you've got some great um, campaigns there. Your um, ending at large voting is a great campaign, yep. just like Roanoke and the uh, gentrification and urban removal of the Gainesville community. And don't forget, we fought that ACP down here really hard. That, we that's right. Well, and, and they've still got the Mountain Valley. So we've got a lot to do. Yeah. Well, we're supporting them there up north, too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Take care. And Steph is one of our phone bankers. Thank you, Steph, <laughs> for doing all that. You guys are awesome. I just like us coming together and just fighting for our country. It's yeah. about time. Yeah. Yeah. Guys. yeah. Yep. 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 Well, all right. I am going to bid you all good night. Have a wonderful evening. And um, Nancy's already got the PowerPoint, and um, you'll get all the important links in your after the event email and please join us next week for Accelerating Justice. When justice is not equal. And I'll try to send that out tonight or tomorrow early, but. I was going to say, we'll, we'll all still be here tomorrow, Nancy. So. Except Andrew, I'm babysitting, so I might not be able to do anything. You're right. Oh, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Speaking oh. of babies, speaking of babies, oh, my new granddaughter, oh. born on Sunday. Oh, congratulations. That's Her wow. name wow. is Lucia. Yeah. Yeah. baby. Cute. Yes, Cute. I know. We just Ooh. always love babies. Babies are wonderful. They were over today. They were over today. Oh, oh so great. she is a yeah, they were over. Uh, they came over for breakfast. She is a good baby. Just is wonderful. And sleep baby is a good baby. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> she she wakes up to eat, sort of. Then she goes back to sleep and then she eats and goes back to sleep. And it's like, that's great. I mean, her mom says she's only up with her three times at night. There's no crying and carrying on. I mean, mm -hmm. Those of you who've met my daughter, you know just how <sighs> cool and laid back she is. <laughs> Any more laid back, she wouldn't be able to stand up right. <laughs> <laughs>
Wonderful. Congratulations, yeah. Andrea. The oh, Valentine's baby. Yes, 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 yes. It certainly mm -hmm. was. It certainly was. What a present. Yeah. So right. I am very, 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 very happy. So mm -hmm. take care, everybody. So, yes. Thank Hello. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.